All right. Thank you all very much for participating in this experiment. As, as I think you heard, this is this forum's first attempt to use breakout groups. So we'll reserve a judgment until we hear the reports, but at least based on my sample of one, I, I thought it was quite useful. Um, okay, we're going to go slightly, well, more than slightly, we're going to go totally out of order here because of imminent departures of key people. So we're, we're going to start with a report from Group 4, which is Global Policy and Coordination. Uh, Suri Moon was the uh, moderator. Um, as you've heard, she is Director of Research at the Global Health Center and Graduate Institute of International and Development Studies in Geneva and an adjunct lecturer on global health at Harvard T.H. Chan uh, School of Public Health. Sorry. Great. Thanks very much. And thanks to my group. I apologize that I need to leave early um, at 3 o'clock mid-panel. Um, but I do count on uh, our rapporteur, Rachel, who's in the back, and also members of our group to dive in during the Q&A to better represent what our group discussed if, um, if necessary. So what I'd like to do is to try to summarize where we got using my um, manual PowerPoint slide here, <laughs> if everybody can, can <laughs> see it. Oh, thank, you. thank you very much. Uh, so we began um, looking at what I would call AMR world, in a way. Uh, and you, if you can. Oh, speak into my microphone. Yes. OK. Uh, we began talking about AMR world. And it was pointed out that this is a world of about 10,000 pieces. Thanks very much. Um, that may or may not fit together into a puzzle. It was pointed out that it's important to keep in mind the global context, uh, the global political context in particular, and the fact that the appetite for big multilateral solutions might not be as high as it once was. Um, that said, we do already, uh, fortunately perhaps, have in fact a number of big multilateral plans in place, including the WHO Global Action Plan and the UN High Level meeting uh, political declaration. And so much of our, cons our, our uh, discussion really focused in on the types of activities that need to take place at a transnational level, whether that's regional or global, but not necessarily the need for new big agreements or declarations um, at, the, at the worldwide level. So we focused in on what I would say are two different types of activities that we thought might be needed. The first has to do with convening. And the convening can be bringing together this global community of practice around uh, AMR or, or DRI uh, so that people, in fact, just get to know what others are doing, where there are gaps, where they might uh, help to fill in gaps. And that would be, of course, stakeholders from, from all sectors. Um, it would also be very useful to have smaller groups uh, or more strategic convening, for example, among private sector actors who could exchange practices with each other. How did they manage to reduce antibiotic use in a particular um, mode of production, for example, or among scientific researchers, or among those who are uh, prescribers. So those who are working um, very much at a concrete day-to-day uh, -day level, dealing with problems, finding solutions to problems, but would benefit from a network of exchange that is um, transnational or, or global. Uh, another possible group would be those working on stewardship practices or policies. So the idea is that there is a need for uh, a number of different types of convenings to happen. The second is that there might be a need for um, more concerted coordination. So not just people getting together to talk shop uh, and learn from each other, but actual uh, coordination. And we identified a few areas where, where that would be needed. So the first would be in research and development of health technologies, a need for there to be more uh, global coordination for the economic incentives that are provided, as well as the regulatory and policy frameworks within which R&D is happening and within which, of course, products eventually get used. Perhaps coordination, for example, among funders, particularly funders that are supporting um, uh, work at country level, the building up of systems, uh, et cetera. Um, and uh, in terms of some of the economic actors, whether in agriculture, or aquaculture, uh, other sectors, again, a need for the appropriate incentives as well as a regulatory um, and policy framework. And the, the importance of these small tweaks or levers such as trade, uh, trade um, policies or trade incentives that can in fact change the behavior of actors um, uh, without having to resort to necessarily global level plans or, um, or strategies. Uh, finally, I wanted to highlight that we thought about AMR world, but it was very much pointed out that AMR world might not necessarily be the best way to frame some or all of these activities because of the natural overlap, for example, with um, 
uh, global health security or with uh, universal health coverage or um, outside of the human health sphere. I'm sure there are other uh, ways in which the issue might be framed or picked up in different communities of practice so that we don't necessarily want to stay uh, within AMR world all the time. Uh, and then the last thing, I, I did actually forget one thing, is that we, we can think about a complex global system with 10,000 pieces in the puzzle. How do we make sure that that system continues to evolve in a forward direction in line with the global goals, uh, strategies, and action plans that in fact have been agreed over the last couple of years? And there is a monitoring and accountability system in place uh, at the UN level, but there, there may be a need for other monitoring and accountability efforts to keep that entire system gradually moving forward. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, I'm debating how to handle this. Let's, because Suri has to leave, are there any specific uh, questions or remarks you want to, or uh, you want to address to her? Clarification, et cetera. Okay. Uh, let's save the general discussion for the end because I, I think it'll help us to hear all the reports and then we can come back and ask for clarifications and identify gaps, et cetera. So you don't have to and so Dr. Duchin here tells me I don't have to introduce him. He, he was a very effective chair of uh, Group 1, which focused on surveillance. Thank you, Jim, and thank you to the members of our uh, surveillance discussion and also to Ishan from the Board on Global Health for our doing rapporteur work for us. Um, we have three recommendations and one comment. Um, so our first recommendation is to optimize data acquisition from existing sources, and that would include uh, things like antibiotic prescribing patterns, antibiograms from clinical uh, healthcare facilities and DOD. Uh, information from clinical laboratories, such including isolate repositories, um, information from healthcare systems on outcomes of patients with antimicrobial uh, drug resistant infections, and, and information on antimicrobial, antimicrobial drug usage, both in humans and animals. This would also include um, incorporating information from citizen science, in particular related to environmental sampling, which is a are another recommendation that I'll get to in a sec, and including data from veterinary diagnostic laboratories uh, such as state diagnostic laboratories for animals, veterinary labs, uh, and uh, data from the FDA. And to incorporate this data into a uh, central data repository or warehouse where others can, uh, can find uh, that data in, in uh, a standardized format for analysis and interpretation and perhaps with guidelines for interpretation. Uh, the second recommendation is a simple one, uh, at least simple to, to verbalize, and that is to adopt uh, the, the recommendations of the World Health Organization's Advisory Group on Integrated Surveillance for Antimicrobial Resistance, which will help with the standardization of surveillance systems, and um, that would include issues such as uh, what organisms to surveil for and what priority order, uh, laboratory methods, uh, data, uh, um, data quality issues, sampling methods, and uh, culture and recovery methods. Uh, but not the environmental sampling. And so our third um, recommendation is to improve environmental, uh, improve and standardize environmental surveillance, which would include things like locations for obtaining surveillance, uh, isolates, use of molecular, well, I shouldn't, maybe shouldn't say isolates, use of molecular and other methods to do surveillance, um, and data collection protocols that would accompany uh, the guidance. Uh, and to make this uh, issue of um, environmental sampling a pre-competitive pre a process or pre establish pre-competitive status among uh, the producers so we have uh, more extensive sampling of, uh, of animals, farm animals, and to include um, the Genome Measures Consortium standards as part of the, um, the standardization process around environmental sampling. Um, we also wanted to um, to mention, although we, we couldn't uh, include it in our top three, the critical issue of culture-independent diagnostic testing and, and molecular methods 
and uh, help uh, emphasizing the need for guidance on uh, the role of these methods, how they should be used and interpreted, and their implications for um, various aspects of surveillance and response. Um, I would also invite the members of my group to shout out if I missed anything big. Amen. Thank you. <laughs> Thank <I'm> you. Stifling. <laughs> Okay, um, next we'll uh, go to group two, uh, stewardship, infection prevention, and behavior uh, modification. Uh, and that was uh, ably uh, moderated by John Rex, uh, who was introduced earlier. So we'll simply remind people that he's chief strategy officer for CARB-X and a member of PACCAR. So our group divided the discussion up into human and veterinary uh, attacks on those three areas and wound up with uh, some common recommendations for each of them and then one distinct one for each. So the common recommendations for both human and veterinary were first uh, the, the drumbeat for more vaccines comes through over and over again and that, and that entails everything from funding of the basic science required to create the vaccines uh, to uh, ensuring that you're actually spending your effort on uh, priority targets for vaccines. So there's a, some work to be done on what you'd like to have a vaccine for and some work to be done on how you would uh, do the basic science. The other common theme that came up was around workforce. And this is about training of healthcare providers, training of uh, leadership and standardized curricula that would include stewardship-based elements and, and in fact, I'm going to add infection prevention-based elements, but curricula that covers those three areas uh, along with uh, just deliberate efforts to, dra to train the technical people involved. Do we have enough, do we have enough vets? Do we have enough uh, animal health scientists? Do we have enough uh, you know, whatever kind of healthcare practitioner is most appropriate to any given region? So be sure that we've built up the workforce. So more vaccines and workforce uh, came through as relevant to both sides. And then the things that were distinct, on the human side, we, we s settled on a recommendation. That it was, it's really about measuring and reporting, and it kind of fits in with the stuff that Jeff was just talking about, about data and data standards and rolling up the data. And we didn't spend a lot of time well, actually, we brainstormed a little bit on the kinds of things you could measure and report. So the usage could be reported, usage by, usage by tonnage by the you know, a territory, usage by healthcare providers, uh, and it was it, it was sort of sparked by the discussions by the presentation yesterday by Dr. Linder, where simply doing measuring also has an impact on people's behavior. So uh, you know, we realized that uh, it might be hard to measure everything you wanted to know, but the very act of doing some measuring and telling people that you were going to measure and some small amount of feedback seemed, you know, to build on those ideas. And someone observed that the Netherlands has a cloud-based app for at least some part of this, so we thought we might write them for a, for a license. Um, on the veterinary side, we recognized that there was a gap around, I'm going to call it stewardship and incentive principles for all of the domains of veterinary medicine. So for food animals, there's a lot of guidance now, and you guys can correct me if I get this wrong, but a lot of guidance now on stewardship principles, and there's a certain amount of in incentive, but it's actually more, uh, probably more stick than it is carrot, as far as I can tell. But anyway, there's some of that structure is there, and also the labeled products that you can use for uh, beef. Uh, it, you know, they, they exist, the tools exist. Whereas there seems to be a gap around companion animals and uh, companion animals, both the mammalian, I guess, and fishy ones, uh, the, we, we don't, we may not have all the tools that we need. So there's a, it's a pretty serious question to ask about: Do we have the tools we need, and how would you structure stewardship and incentive uh, tools for that space? Uh, and one of the, if there were had two vets in our group, you guys want to expand on that? Have I said it more or less? Correctly, it would it would take a workshop to dissect it and figure out what all's in there, but it felt like that was a, a gap that needed some serious work. Okay, thank you. Any uh, questions or comments from members of that group? Okay, 
Um, last but not least, Group 3, Basic and Applied Research and Development. Uh, Dr. Emily El Erbelding will uh, give this report. As you've heard, she's from DMID at NIAID at NIH. Thanks. So we had an invigorating discussion in our group. Um, for our recommended research, we thought that taking a, an ecologic systems biology approach would be important. Um, this ecological system would be comprised of farms, community, everything else in the community, um, measurements of the water system, measurements of antibiotic use, measurements of the food. And within that system, you would want to be able to describe um, the, the microbiome, the things that might correlate with what, what has been called the resistome, the genetic elements of health importance that are, that are negative and associated with negative outcomes and, and um, resistance. So that would be sort of this longitudinal ecosystem would be the important thing to set up. A lot of the data inputs might be things that Jeff just described in surveillance, but additional elements as well. We thought that with a description of the whole ecosystem, you can come up with biosignatures of resistance in each compartment, and those could be validated um, by seeing what happened when you perturb the system in some positive or negative way. So then you could test, if you had this system and you had these validated biosignatures, you could test specific interventions. You could compare uh, a farm practice one to another or an animal product, food production practice one to another. Um, compare different practices and measure the persistence. If you changed the resistome in some way that was valid, you can measure the persistence of the impact of that practice over time. If you had these validated biosignatures, you could also do modeling in other ecosystems, um, and you could model various new approaches, probiotics, um, other sorts of animal management use in those systems. So those were the three things, developing the ecosystem, um, validating bio, to validate biosignatures, testing interventions, and then um, applying modeling to other, um, other similar systems. All right. Thank you. Um, questions or comments, uh, additions from members of that group? If not, let's open it up. Reaction, comments, gaps, opportun missed opportunities.